Hi there, I'm Alex Plotnik, and this is Module 2 of the first ever GLOW online course. In Modules 0 and 1, Farah and I gave a brief overview of the course, the goals of GLOW, and how to install it and run some basic commands. In this module, we'll cover running simple but non-trivial interactions with GLOW and the basics of GLOW programming. The programs we'll cover in this module will be small and simple, but still illustrate many of the capabilities and primary concepts of GLOW. All right, let's get started. Okay, the first dApp that we're going to explore is called BISIG. We have an alternate name for it that we use sometimes, which is closing, because that's one way to think about what it represents abstractly. The closing or signing of a sale or some other agreement between two parties, as in, we closed on our new house today. But I personally prefer its original name, BISIG, because it perfectly captures what the program actually does. It allows one program to purchase a digital signature from another. Now, in real life, when you close on a sale, the buyer and seller don't have to trust each other, but they do usually have to trust some third party, like an escrow agent or a notary. But in a distributed application, we don't need that central trusted third party because we have a distributed consensus, something like a blockchain, that we believe can be trusted because of proof of work or proof of stake or whatever the mechanism is that the network uses to ensure consistency. So here we have a diagram that shows the protocol for this interaction. We have two participants, the buyer on the left and the seller on the right. And in the middle we have the consensus, which right now is always a blockchain, and more specifically right now is basically always Ethereum, but soon it could also be Cardano and maybe some others. So for now, we'll just assume that it's Ethereum or some other network that runs the Ethereum virtual machine, and I will talk about accounts rather than UTXOs. Okay, the idea of this interaction is that buyer wants to pay seller for their signature on some message. And for the message, we'll just take that to be an arbitrary hash or digest. And by that I mean it's the output of a cryptographic hash function like SHA-256 or KEKAC or one of those. And the underlying object that's hashed could be anything. It could be a PDF that describes the terms of the sale in English, it could be a blob of XML or JSON that describes it using some schema, or whatever. It doesn't matter for our purposes because we'll only be concerned with the hash, not the underlying object. So the interaction proceeds like this, and time goes downwards in this diagram. First, the buyer sets up the buy sig contract, including the digest to be signed, the participants' addresses, and so on and they also deposit the agreed-upon price for the signature in whatever token into the contract account, and that is now in escrow. If there's an error or a timeout or the seller doesn't cooperate for some reason, it's very important that that escrow be returned to the buyer, and we'll come back to that point in a few minutes. Okay, the next step is that the seller, after seeing that the buyer created the contract, they look at that contract, they make sure that it agrees with what they agreed to and expected to see, and if everything looks all right, then they sign the digest and they publish that signature on the chain. And then the final step happens entirely on the chain. The signature is checked against the seller's public key, and if it matches, the escrow is released to the seller. The terms of the contract have been fulfilled, and the interaction is over. Okay, let's see this interaction run in Glow. To run by SIG, we'll actually need to run two instances of Glow, one for the buyer and one for the seller. I'll run these in the two terminals you see here. The upper one is selected now, here's the lower one. So if we run Glow list identities, we can see the uh, two identities that I'll use for this run, namely Alice here at this address and Bob at this address. And you'll notice that I've encoded uh, something that looks sort of like Alice and something that looks sort of like Bob in these addresses. And that's so that we can tell them apart from the transaction output, which doesn't map back to nicknames. Okay, a few last bits of setup. Um, I'm running a local Ethereum test network here with Geth, which was started with our run Ethereum testnet script. And I've funded both of these accounts, Alice and Bob, with Glow Faucet. Uh, you might think that you could fund just the buyer, but the seller also needs to pay some gas feeds, and so needs a small amount of token as well. Okay, let's finally run our first Glow dApp. I'm going to do this longhand the first time through, and then I'll show you how you can shortcut some of the interactive steps and make it run in more of a batch mode. So we start a Glow interaction, unsurprisingly, with the command glow start interaction. 
And the one required parameter here is the EVM network that we want to run on. And so we're going to run on our local test network called PET. And for now, we won't tell it anything else on the command line. So Glow starts up, and it begins by asking us, well, which dApp would we like to run? And these three dApps, by SIG, CoinFlip, and RPS Simple, are exactly what you'd see if you ran Glow's applications. Here's those three, and it tells you the locations as well. So here we're going to run by SIG, that's option one. And now it'll ask us some more questions about uh, that specific contract that we're running. So it's asking us to choose our identity. So we said in this top terminal, we're going to pretend to be Alice, and that's identity number two in this list. And Alice is going to be playing the role of the buyer in this interaction, so that's option one. And so now it needs to know, okay, if Alice is the buyer, who is the seller? So we'll say Bob, that's four. And then it asks us which token we want to use. And here we'll stick to the native token on this network, which is PET. But you can, for example, and we'll see this later in the course, you can write contracts that swap native tokens for other tokens, ERC-20s, and so on. Okay, now come two very important parameters, which are the digest that we'd like signed and the price that we'd like to pay for that signature. And so I have here in my clipboard a totally random hash that was actually a transaction ID, but it doesn't matter, it's a hash on the network. And let's say that the price that Bob wants to charge for this signature on that digest is my favorite amount, which is pi pet. And this looks like a really big number, but in fact, this is in units of way, which is 10 to the minus 18th pet. And so this is actually 3.14, etc. pet. Okay, now the last parameter that we're asked for is the max initial block. And that's the last block number on the selected network that's the last acceptable block to start the interaction by. And we're going to come back to that and discuss that parameter a little later in the course when we talk about timeouts and those sorts of things. So for right now, we can just take the current block number, copy and paste it. Okay, now Glow it has now set up the on-chain code for this interaction, and now, as it says, it's waiting for the seller to make a move. So let's run the seller's part of this interaction. So we're going to start the interaction in basically the same way, in the Glow start interaction, dash dash EVM network pet, and we have to add one additional argument here, which is database, and we'll call this Bob. And this is to tell Glow to keep the transaction logs for Alice and Bob separate, and this is a limitation that's going to go away real soon now in Glow development. Okay, so here we're going to choose the same application by SIG, and we're going to tell it that in this terminal our identity is Bob, so that's four here. And the role that we'll be playing is that of the seller, and the buyer is Alice, and we're going to use the native token pet, and now the digest has to match exactly the digest that Alice would like signed, and the price of course has to match on the two sides, so we'll paste that pi pet in here, and the max initial block also needs to match, so we'll do that here. Okay, and now Glow tells us to paste the handshake sent by the other participant. And so what this is, is the buyer and seller are all set on this agreement, but they need to exchange this handshake off the chain that tells them, yes, we've agreed to the same parameters, and it's time to start the transaction. And this handshake being exchanged off the chain can be exchanged in a number of ways. In a real application, you'd obviously need to use a network. And we'll see a little later in the course how to do that. And this is an area, again, that's under active development in Glow. So for right now, for the purposes of demonstration, the communications channel, the off-chain communications channel for this handshake will be my clipboard. I'm going to copy it from the upper terminal and paste it into the lower terminal. And again, we're going to come back and see more realistic ways of exchanging that handshake later on. Okay, so as soon as I paste that handshake, Bob's instance of Glow runs its one move, which is to sign the digest and publish it on the chain. And then as soon as that happens, notice that both sides of this interaction, Alice and Bob here, have terminated. The reason is the signature was valid, so the escrow is transferred to Bob and the interaction is over. Okay, we've just run our first Glow interaction. Let's go look at the code. Now that we've seen the BiSig program run and understand what it does, let's take a look at the implementation. 
It is six lines of glow, not counting the one blank line that separates the buyer's move from the seller's. Let's take a look at what's going on here. So the place to start is actually not line one, but line two. Let's cut away some of this unfamiliar looking stuff. Just trim it and come back to it and see if we can get at the basic structure. The core of Glow is a JavaScript-like, purely functional language. This is a JavaScript let binding. It declares a variable called bisig, whose value is a function expressed with the JavaScript fat arrow notation. This is a fat arrow. This is the parameter list of the function, and we can see that it takes two parameters called digest and price. And their types are these Glow built-in types, namely digest and nat. So digest represents a digest or a hash on the network that you're running on. For an EVM compatible chain, this will be a KEKAC 256 hash. Nat stands for natural number, and it represents a non-negative integer of some fixed width here, exactly 256 bits on an EVM compatible chain, but on other networks it could be different. All right, so it's a function definition. That's great, but what does Glow do with that function, and what does the function do? So let's restore our line one. Uh, let's keep the body trimmed for now, excuse me. And let's look at this annotation on line one. Line one does not look like JavaScript, and it's a design principle of Glow that if it doesn't look like JavaScript, it isn't. So this is a Glow annotation. The at sign means that this annotation modifies the meaning of the JavaScript statement that follows it. The JavaScript statement that follows is exactly the let binding that we were just talking about. And its new meaning is that the function, the value bound by the let, defines an interaction with roles, buyer, and seller. So this is a two element list, these square brackets, and it declares here two roles. And in principle, Glow supports more than two roles per interaction, and eventually it will support arbitrary numbers, but we're going to stick with two for now. I will say one more thing about at annotations in Glow. Well, actually two things. One is that the complete list of annotations can be found in the Glow reference manual, which is available at glowlang.org. The second is about the semantics of these annotations generally. These are dApp specific annotations. And the idea is that if you were to erase all of the at annotations from your Glow program, and if all of the roles trusted each other, and if the program was running on a centralized computer, then the results would be the same as the normal distributed running of the Glow program with the at annotations. So in other words, these annotations control where and how the pieces of code in the dApp run but if you were to collapse the distributed app into a centralized app and assume trust and good intentions, which are dubious assumptions to be sure, then those distinctions wouldn't matter. And so what these annotations do is they allow you to write code for your app that allows the app itself to be distributed and for the roles not necessarily to trust one another. Okay, let's dive into this function body now. So on line three, we see this deposit bang thing. And it doesn't look like JavaScript, so it isn't. It's a Glow directive that has a side effect on the chain. And that's what the bang indicates. This is a convention that we got from the scheme programming language. The syntax of this directive is as follows. There is a role, and then a right arrow, and then an expression, which here is just a single variable, the argument price, the argument that comes in through this function. And what this statement means is that the identity that assumes the role, this role, buyer, at runtime, should deposit the amount given by price into the contract account to be held in escrow. And that's, of course, the first step of this protocol, which is that the buyer deposits the escrow. And in fact, it's the buyer's only move. Okay, so let's go to the seller side now. So line five starts with an at annotation. Let's just erase that for now so we can see the structure again. So this is straightforward enough. It's a JavaScript let binding. The variable is signature. The value is the result of calling the function sign on the argument digest, which again is this digest. So sign is another glow built in, but it's not really dApp specific, so it doesn't have a special syntax. You can just call it like a normal function. And what it does is produce a cryptographic signature of the argument that you pass in. And it does this in a way that is specific to the network that it's running on. 
So the EVM uses ECDSA over the elliptic curve SECP256K1, but other networks may use other signature algorithms, Schnorr algorithms or something like that, or other curves or RSA or whatever. And this is a simple but convenient abstraction that Glow gives you. You don't have to worry or even remember the specifics of the signature algorithm that you are working with. You just sign the thing that you want to sign. Okay, let's put the annotation back so, and, and look at it. This annotation is a little funny because it's both an at annotation and a bang directive. And the reason that it has both of those symbols is that it does two things. It does modify the meaning of the let statement that follows, and it has a side effect on the chain. What this annotation does is to write the value of the variable bound onto the chain, and that value must be a digital signature, and that signature must be valid. Just to make this really clear, I'm going to show what this actually expands to inside the Glow compiler. So here's the line that we were just talking about, and this, no, I'm going to shrink it down. And these comments tell us what it expands into. So this at publicly bang is equivalent to these three lines, at verifiably, and then the let, and then a publish. So this verifiably says, we're going to sign this thing, and we're going to do so in a way that verifies the signature right on the chain. And then we're going to publish the signature, and then we're going to verify that it's valid. And this verify signature is really the same as require is valid signature, and is valid signature goes along with sign. These are Glow built-in functions that produce on-chain code that checks the validity of a digital signature. Okay, but you don't have to worry about that. You can just write at publicly sign the digest. I just wanted to show you what was going on a little bit under the hood, and we're going to talk some more about that later. Okay, so this is really two statements in one. What it does is it makes a signature, it publishes it on the chain so that everyone can verify that it is in fact valid. All right, only one line left. So line six is the converse of line three. Uh, it withdraws the escrow into the seller's account. Now, if, for instance, the public signature val validation on line five had failed, then the statement on line six would not be executed. And the question is, what would happen then? And the answer is that Glow will refund the escrow to the buyer because it tracks all of the deposit and withdrawal statements and ensures that either they all get executed correctly or the proper refunds are made. One way or another, the token does, doesn't just disappear. And the idea here is that it's really hard to accidentally lock up your tokens in a Glow contract, unlike in certain lower level languages where it's really easy. Okay, let's go through the whole thing once more, but faster this time. So, this is a Glow program that describes an interaction between an interaction between two roles, the buyer and the seller. It is a function that takes two parameters, the digest for seller to sign, and the price that they've agreed on for that signature. Uh, if you remember when we ran the program in Glow, Glow asked us to define some parameters and then asked us for values of digest and price. That's, this is where it got those two names and where it put those values when it was done. And you can supply those values up front. You don't have to have Glow ask you interactively. Okay, the function itself does three things, or really two and a half. Buyer deposits the price into escrow, then the seller signs the digest publicly and verifiably, and then they withdraw the escrow price. And that's it. That's the whole signature buying protocol that we talked about at the beginning. And I like this example because there's not really a single line that you could argue about. Each statement's purpose follows directly from the protocol and is essential. I'd like to take just a minute and talk a bit about what's going on under the hood. So when you run a Glow interaction, it first prompts you for which dApp you're running, but then the second thing that it does is it prompts you for your identity, remember, and then it asks you to choose your role. And so we can now understand a little bit more about what's going on here. These roles are taken from this interaction annotation, and the identities that it asks you about are just the identities in your in your contact book. And what it's doing is it's building a map from identities of the participants in the interaction to the roles that they play in that interaction. Now once that map is built, each Glow instance assumes a particular identity, and then it interprets that participant's code, which can and does differ from other participants' code. And so the way that it does this is using a process called endpoint projection. And you can see this, you can see the compiler do this with 
glow pass, that's compiler pass, project here means endpoint projection, and then the name of the DApp. And this will show you the output of the glow compiler. And you can see that it takes our one function and it produces from it three blobs of code, one that runs on the chain and then one for each role that doesn't run on the chain, for the off-chain code. And we won't be getting into the details of this in this course, but if you're interested in hacking on Glow itself, or just understanding what it's doing at a deeper level, I would recommend checking it out. But I want to mention it here because this model of endpoint projection and then each identity running separate code will help you when you write Glow programs to understand what's going on. That each role has a piece of the code that they run and that those pieces are mediated by the code that runs on the central consensus that is on the chain. Let's take a look now at a slightly less trivial DApp. Well, in a sense, its purpose is more trivial, that is, to play a game, but the program is less trivial. This is a Glow program that lets two players, here denoted in the roles A and B, to play a game of rock, paper, scissors. So as a reminder, in real life, to play this game, the two players shoot a hand shaped either like a rock, a paper, or scissors. And the rules are that paper beats rock, scissors beats paper, and rock beats scissors. And if the two hands are the same, it's a draw. So to play this game on a blockchain, we need to somehow encode the rules and the playing. So here's the basic encoding. We'll use natural numbers between 0 and 2 to represent the hands. So 0 is rock, 1 is paper, and 2 is scissors. And to figure out who won, if you have a pair of such hands, we can use this tiny function here. So this is a JavaScript let binding whose value is a function using this fat arrow notation. The function takes two natural numbers and returns a natural number. The two numbers represent the two hands, A and B. And the winner is computed by this small bit of modular arithmetic. And I will leave it as an exercise to go through and verify that this arithmetic does in fact compute a winner using this encoding. If the result is 0, then B wins, and if the result is 1, then it's a draw, and if the result is 2, then A wins. And the way we'll use this little function is in our main function, we'll let the outcome be the winner of the finally revealed hands, and we'll talk about that in a second, and then we'll just switch on that outcome. Now let's look at this next function. Here we see the same kind of interaction annotation that we saw in bisig, and as before, there are two roles, again, A and B here. Uh, and this function, this is a function, it's a fat arrow, this function takes one argument, which is the wager amount, which is analogous to the price in bisig. It's the amount that A and B have agreed to bet on the outcome of this game, and we'll assume that they're betting the same amount and not playing with odds or anything like that. Let's go into the body of the function. In the body of the function, we immediately see something new, which is this at a annotation. What does that mean? Well, it's an at annotation, so let's see if we can understand the statement that it modifies. This is a let binding of a variable called hand a, and it's going to represent, naturally, player a's hand in this game of rock, paper, scissors. And where that comes from is it's the result of calling the glow built-in function input. input spits out a prompt that's given by its second argument and asks the user, either interactively in the terminal or through a dialog in the UI, to enter a value. And then that value is interpreted as an element of type nat here. And so basically what this does is it asks the user for a number. So then naturally the very next thing that we do is check that that number is in fact encoded properly, that it's less than three and implicitly greater than zero. But what does this at a mean? Well, the annotation makes the let binding private to this participant, to this role. And so this says that only the participant playing the role A in this interaction will run that statement. And so only A will see what hand is chosen, and therefore only A can verify that it's a valid value. And that is crucial because if B could see A's hand ahead of time, they could just choose a winning hand every time. Now let's see what happens with B. The first thing that happens is that they privately choose a hand. That's what this at B annotation on the variable hand B does. They, but then they immediately publish it directly, that is without hashing, and then deposit their wager. Now why do they do that? 
They can do that because A has already committed to their hand, and so A can't choose a new hand after seeing B's. And the reason that this let is private to B is that they don't want anyone else to choose their hand, in particular A. So this input is executed only by B, who then publishes their hand, and then everyone on the chain can verify that that hand is valid, because it's in clear text, it's not hashed. And then B completes their commitment by putting the wager amount into escrow. Now let's look at these next three lines. The first says that A publishes their two secret pieces of data, that is, the random salt and the hand that they chose. Now, having done so, everyone can require that that hand be valid, that it be an integer between 0 and 2 inclusive. But then they can go further, they can verify the commitment. And what this does is it looks at how this commitment variable was defined, remember it was defined with verifiably, and it has record, Glow has recorded the fact that this commitment was derived via a digest from salt and hand A. And having published salt and hand A on the chain, now everyone can verify the commitment by rerunning the digest on the now revealed salt and hand A. And so that's what this verify line does, is it ensures that every participant verifies that the hand and the salt that were revealed indeed produce the commitment that was made earlier. Okay, almost there. What's happened so far is this. A chose their hand and published a verifiable commitment to that hand and deposited their wager into escrow. Then B chose a hand and immediately published it and deposited their wager into escrow. Then A revealed their hand and everyone verified that it matches the published commitment. So all that's left to do now is to figure out who won and distribute the winnings. And that's what happens here. We call the winner function that we defined up at the top, and then we just switch on the encoded result. So if B wins, if the uh, outcome is zero, and that's from this encoding, zero is B wins, then B gets to withdraw twice the wager amount. B has won the bet, and so they get all the winnings. Uh, if the outcome was 1, that is a draw, and so A gets their wager amount back, and B gets their wager amount back. The last possibility is 2, which uh, represents A winning, and so naturally, in that case, A gets twice the wager amount. Uh, and finally, the function just returns that outcome, that encoded outcome, but we're not going to use that return value right now. Okay. Now that we've gone so carefully over the code for rock, paper, scissors, let's actually play a game. We'll start in the same way as we did for BISIG, with glow, start interaction, and specifying the pet network. Except now we'll choose RPS simple as the application. We will again in this upper terminal be the identity Alice, and we will be playing role A. The role of B will be played by Bob. We will use the native token on this network. And now we have one parameter to define, which is the argument to the function that defines the interaction, and that's wager amount. So we will bet pipet, and we will take the current block number as the max initial block. And then A starts executing code. And the first uh, thing that it prompts us for is that first input statement. It says, first player, pick your hand. So we are the first player. We will be boring and choose zero for rock. And now A starts executing some more code and realizes that it needs to wait for B to make their move. So let's fire up B. We'll do that in the same way using this database Bob flag. And we will choose RPS simple. We will choose to be Bob. We will be playing the role of B. The role of A will be played by Alice. We will be using the native token. We will bet pipet. And we will use Alice's current block number as our max initial block number. Okay, now we're ready to exchange the handshake, which we will again do using the clipboard. And now B starts executing code, and B immediately comes to this input, wherein the second player is asked to choose their hand. We are B in this lower terminal, and notice that A is still waiting, right? So we're going to pick our hand and then publish it, and as soon as we do that, a makes their next move. Notice that B is now waiting for A, and the move that A makes is to reveal those secret values of the salt 
and their hand. And notice that these values match what we expect. We chose 0 for A, also 0 for B, and the outcome is 1, which represents a draw in our output encoding. And this salt value should be different on every run of rock, paper, scissors because it should be a different random integer. And uh, of course, we see that our wager amount is our pi pet as expected. So that was a complete run of rock, paper, scissors. Now I'd like to assign you some homework. This homework has four parts, and you can do as many or as few as you feel comfortable with or have time for. The first part should be really easy if you followed along so far, and that is to run by SIG and RPS simple for yourself. You'll need a pair of terminals and to do some copying and pasting, uh, but you should be able to run the, the interactions between two identities. Okay, the next parts require you to write your own D app, or rather to modify one of the ones that we've seen. And that's really the subject of the next lecture, but I can show you the basics very quickly. So when we run Glow List Applications, it lists the three standard contracts, two of which we've talk talked about today, by SIG and RPS Simple. So how do we tell it to find a new one? Well, first thing that we'll need to do is make a directory to put them. Let's just call it temp dapps for now. And then you'll need a dapp. So let's just copy, let's say, by SIG, copy that one into that directory, and let's rename it just for fun. Call it cellsig.glow. And now we have to tell glow to look in that directory. And the way that we do that is we set the glow underscore path environment variable to uh, that directory, temp dapps. And now, if we run glow list applications, it will find cellsig.glow in that directory. And if we were to run start interaction, then it'll ask us to choose an application, and the only choice that it knows about right now is cellsig, which, of course, since I copied the file, is the same as bisig right now. The three non-trivial parts of the homework are to write some variations on uh, ideas that we've already seen. So the first one is to write an interaction that transfers some amount of token between two participants. And you should probably start that one from scratch. Second, modify by SIG to do something else. It could be some other form of sale or a simple swap or maybe a discount. It doesn't matter. The point is to make something up and encode it using Glow using a variation of the simple contract that we've already studied. Three, modify rock, paper, scissors to play a new game. This could be evens and odds, or any other simple two-player game where they each choose some hand and some simple decision procedure determines the winner. Use what you've learned about rock, paper, scissors to design an encoding for both the hands and the gameplay, and modify rock, the rock, paper, scissors contract for your game. Then make sure you can play it, and make sure it's fun. Well, we've covered a lot of ground here, and I'm not going to keep you much longer. We're going to wrap up with a quick note on running Glow in a batch mode and a sneak peek at the UI, which makes running these kinds of standard interactions a lot easier. We're going to circle back to buy SIG for this example, this batch example. And one question you'll immediately have when you start playing with it is, but where do I get the digest to be signed? I happen to have one in my clipboard, but you may not. So, of course, there are many ways, but one easy way is with this command Glow Digest. So let me show you that. Glow Help Digest. Glow Digest computes the cryptographic digest for a given file. It does more or less what you'd expect. So you can take the Glow Digest of Etsy profile, your global profile, and you can notice that it's probably different from your print cap. If they have different contents, it had better be. Um, and if you'd like to just practice with hash functions, if you want to get more familiar with them, this is a great way. Uh, you can just echo, without a trailing new line, any string you like, foo, bar, baz, let's say. Uh, you can just echo that into a file, and then you can say glow digest temp file, and it'll give you the cryptographic hash of that string. Now, if you've been paying careful attention, you'll notice that there's a potential bug in this command, which is that it doesn't take a network option. It should, though, because different networks use different native hash functions. But it's fine for now, because, as I said before, Glow mostly only supports Ethereum-based networks currently, and we're working on that, and they all use the kekak 256 hash function. So when we add uh, native support for other uh, networks that use different hash functions, we'll adjust this command so that it takes a network parameter. Okay, so that's one way to get a digest value for bisig. Now, I promised earlier that I'd show you how to run that interaction in a less interactive way. 
And the reason that's nice is that if you're hacking on it or just playing around with running it in a bunch of different ways, you don't really want to have to go through the whole interactive dialogue twice, once for the buyer and again for the seller, in each run. So the way we give all the parameters at once is like this. And I'm going to go through these one at a time. Now, we already know EVM network. That's a familiar one by now. So let's look at max initial block. This one looks a little funny. And what's going on here is that we need a little bit of a trick. We need the two glow instances for the buyer and the seller to agree on what their max initial block is. But we don't know ahead of time what the current block is going to be. And we can't just have the two participants use the current block because if we start them at different times, then that block could be different and then they won't agree. And so what this percent 10,000 means is it means take the next multiple of 10,000 from the current block. And that should be the same for both of them if they start even remotely close to each other. Now you can experiment with this parameter and see how low you can get it if you'd like. Okay, so the next option is the Glow app. And that's that very first question that Glow asks us when we start it up, which is what D app would, it, would we like to run? The next one specifies the identity to use. So here we're going to be Alice. And then the one after that specifies which role Alice is going to play. And then we'll use this database flag, and we'll do one for Alice too, just so that Alice and Bob are sort of more in sync. It doesn't much matter. You only need a separate database command uh, option for one of the players, but here we'll just use it for both. Okay, and now the next three look a little different. And you'll notice that they look a lot like JSON. This looks like a JSON map. And in accordance with the basic principle of Glow, if it looks like JavaScript, it is. So these are JSON blobs that tell Glow the parameters, the various maps that it needs to build up. So the first map is the map of assets. This tells it which token to use by default. The next map maps the participants to roles. And so this is the role buyer will be played by this identity, and the seller here will be played by this identity. And you'll notice that these are addresses. Uh, we can't use nicknames inside of here currently. That's a limitation that could be removed. Um, but you'll notice that the seller is played by this Bob address and the buyer by Alice. And then finally, we have the parameters of the function, which are the digest that we want signed and the price that we've agreed to. And notice that this is an integer, not a string, but it doesn't really matter here. Um, and so these blobs of JSON are a little bit ugly, but they're not really meant to be entered manually. Uh, the way that they're intended to be generated is programmatically from either a user interface or something wrapping glow or so on. Um, but it's definitely better to type these out once or copy and paste them uh, than to enter them interactively a zillion times while you're debugging your contract. Okay, so let's see it run. Here on the buyer's side, you'll notice that there are no interactive prompts because we've supplied all the information that it needs up front. And so it immediately goes to waiting for the seller to make a move. So over here on the seller's side, we're going to start it up with much the same uh, batch of options. So this max initial block, this should match the one uh, just by arithmetic that the buyer used. Uh, but here we're going to be the identity Bob. Bob is going to assume the role seller, and we're going to use a different database. Uh, the assets map is the same. The participants map is the same. The uh, buyer here is played by this address, this Alice's address, and seller by Bob's address. And then, of course, the parameters are also the same. The digest and the price have to match. So if we run this, then Bob goes immediately into waiting for the handshake. And as we said before, and we'll come back to later in the course, there are other ways of exchanging this handshake, but for right now, we're just going to be uh, do it the dumb way, and we're going to use copy and paste. We're going to use the clipboard. So as soon as I paste this into Bob's terminal here, both sides terminate successfully. And the reason is that Glow had everything that it needed. It had all the information that it needed to complete the transaction on both sides. Okay, let's wrap up with a little sneak peek of the UI. We'll go into this more later on, but I wanted to give you a preview of the easy way now that you've struggled through the hard way. So here we are. This is the Glow UI. It runs in a browser, and it's based around the contacts. So here we see our three contacts, Alex, Alice, and Bob. And let's run BiSig one more time between Alice and Bob. So in this browser tab, I'll be Alice, and I'll select the identity that I want to use. And then in this tab, I'll be Bob. And so we'll use Bob's address here. So Alice starts, 
and Alice picks their identity and then chooses an action. In this case, the action is going to be to buy a signature from someone, from who? Well, from Bob. And now we get to enter our parameters. So we'll use PyPet again as the amount, and we'll use our same digest. And then Alice hits buy signature, and it starts up a Glow instance in just the way that I showed you, in this sort of batch mode. And so now this uh, instance is waiting for the other side to start. So we can switch to the other browser tab and have Bob sell the signature to Alice at this address. Uh, and again, we use the same digest and the same amount. And Bob clicks sell. And now we wait just a moment and both sides complete the transaction successfully because Glow on both sides had all the information that it needed to run this exchange on the local test network. Okay, that about wraps it up for this time. So, in this lecture, we've seen how to run dApps interactively, we've examined the basic syntax and semantics of Glow programs that implement those dApps, and we've talked about encodings and protocols, and we've seen a few different ways of running them. We are sure you're going to have many, many questions, and we are looking forward to our first live Q&A on October 12th, 2021 at 10 p.m. Central European Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 2 p.m. Mountain Time on Discord. We would like to thank you once again for being part of this very first iteration of the Glow MOOC. We'll see you soon!